Uh, my name is Kevin Callahan. I'm with the Eighth Air Force Historical Society of Minnesota. Uh, today's date is uh, Friday, March 16th, 2012. I'm here at the Stillwater uh, Public Library with John Baird, and we're going to do an oral history interview uh, about his time in service and his background. Uh, work. Okay, so I was uh, going to uh, the university uh, at, at uh, as a freshman, and about that time I, I was 18, and uh, the war had started. Uh, uh, I, the uh, about Pearl Harbor, and going back a little bit, I remember very clearly uh, learning about Pearl Harbor because my uh, I was doing my Latin. Uh, lesson, and I, I can, I know exactly where I was sitting at the little table I had between two windows in our family home, uh, and I was listening to the uh, New York Philharmonic, which always had a, a concert on um, Sundays afternoons, and then came this word about. Pearl Harbor. The next day at school, I can clearly remember uh, sitting in uh, the class, I think it was American history uh, class, and the teacher and the students were all talking about the implications of what they'd heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, uh, and then came a lot of dramatic things like the Battle of Britain, and um, we uh, all heard the uh, words from Winston Churchill about uh, fighting on the fields, fighting on the landing grounds, and never giving up, and so on. And uh, so I, as well as a lot of other uh, young men uh, went down as soon as we were old enough, and I think it must have been 18, mm -hmm. and signed up. And I signed up for a, a wonderful three-year program uh, at the university, and you took ROTC, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, when you got out of it at the end of three years, or whatever the period of time was. It was an accelerated uh, program. You went all, uh, you know, all year round. So it may have been less than three years. But anyway, the idea was that when you completed, you would get a commission as a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> that and sounded we, good. <laughs> we had uniforms. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we marched around in the armory building, and uh, uh, we were advised uh, uh, about how to behave uh, in no uncertain terms uh, with regard to our relationship with ladies. Uh, very colorful movies and things they showed us. And, uh, <laughs> You had health education as well as manners. Uh, I, yeah, uh, and of course, um, and, and um, it was all very romantic. And um, the um, the first the first uh, quarter of this uh, program uh, started in the fall and. It, I think it was uh, January or February, the Army changed its plans for us. Instead of keeping us in uh, university for umpteen quarters and coming out of the lieutenant, they called us up immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a, uh, uh, my first introduction to how the Army worked. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we were called up uh, to report uh, at the 
federal building in Minneapolis. I'm going to pause for a moment just for technical reasons. Yeah. Just a second. I'll do this every half an hour just for this digital camera technology. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I got some notes on the subject here. In February of 1943, I received a communication from the Army as follows. From Headquarters, 7th Service Command, Omaha, Nebraska, February 6, 1943. Subject, active duty orders. Two, Air Forces Enlisted Reservists. One, enclosed is a copy of orders calling you to active duty. The orders went out uh, from there telling us, the orders went from there telling us to report uh, not later than 8 a.m., 21st February, 1943 at the Federal Building in Minneapolis. We were to be sent to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Before we get to Jefferson Barracks, could you tell me, now I was too young, I wasn't there when Pearl Harbor happened, what was the reaction of people to this attack on the United States? Did Was it where people upset or? or well, I, I, I'll, I'll give you an interesting little uh, sidelight on that. My family, uh, we're having uh, Sunday dinner uh, with a uh, 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 family in, uh, that lived on the uh, peninsula, correction, on the island at, at uh, White Bear Lake. And the, uh, uh, the people uh, 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 had a very uh, uh, fine uh, home there. and. Uh, Guys, the, uh, their name was Apple. The, uh, uh, the husband's name was Monty Apple, and he was a uh, an attorney in Minneapolis and also a leader uh, of those uh, who felt that we shouldn't have anything to do with the war. He was, a, uh, in other words, a, a, a leading isolationist, and word came. Uh, to them, I suppose somebody had the radio on or something, and so they learned, uh, as I did, that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and uh, Monty Apple uh, uh, had to change his politics uh, instantaneously, and it's the only situation that I've ever been aware of where a political uh, opinion could be proven right or wrong on, and instantaneously because there was absolutely no doubt uh, that being an isolationist wasn't going wasn't to work anymore. And uh, the, the, I, it was my perception that, that uh, everybody uh, was instantaneously caught up in this thing and of course all uh, all uh, red-blooded young men wanted to join the service. Uh, it, it was a totally different situation than uh, we experienced in the Vietnam War and, of course, in the unpleasantness that we've had now for the last decade where uh, it's only a relatively very small percentage of people involved in the military and there isn't any real interest on in the part of most people to to become involved, but at that time, uh, everybody, with the exception of a very few, uh, uh, were caught up in the uh, in the uh, patriotic effort to uh, uh, attack, uh, defend ourselves against both the uh, Japanese and the Germans. Of course. Uh, we had, uh, we had been helping the British uh, uh, for some time, uh, despite the isolationism that was particularly strong in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, I, 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 that's one of the things I have to give credit to Roosevelt for uh, his conviction that we had to support the British and uh, uh, even though they, they, there were an awful lot of people who uh, didn't, didn't believe we had any business doing that. The, uh, mm -hmm. 
as I remember, the land lease, uh, uh, land lease legislation that authorized uh, our giving support to the British uh, had passed uh, one of the houses by one vote. Now, you uh, ended up ultimately in the United States Army Air Force. Did you have any uh, background with airplanes or early jobs that had something to do with airplanes? Uh, very little, except uh, uh, my dad uh, My dad was, uh, uh, for very uh, uh, temporarily, was uh, treasurer of Air Northwest Airlines uh, when it was first uh, uh, organized. Uh, and he, it was just for a very short time until the uh, management could be established. And, uh, and as a result of, uh, of having uh, that position, uh, he uh, offered uh, or suggested that perhaps my brother and I would like to fly in an airplane. So one Sunday we went down to the St. Paul airport and uh, got uh, got into a, a tri-motor Ford and uh, the pilot uh, took us up and flew around so that we could see the countryside and landed at, at uh, Minneapolis, Walt Chamberlain Airport. Uh, and my family drove over and picked us up. So that was my first uh, airplane ride. Now, do you know how old you were or what, about what the year might have been? when they were flying these uh, Ford tri-motors? Well, if I had to guess, I'd say it was probably about 1932. So I was born in, so I would have been six years old. Did you get air sick or anything, or oh, was no, it if I you was enjoyed it? Looking, I, as I remember, the, uh, the, uh, it, was, it was an interesting ride to look out and I could see the countryside didn't take very long. <laughs> <laughs> so your induction was at the federal building in, in downtown. Um, for people that maybe haven't been through the military, what uh, what do they do when you're inducted into the military back then? Did well, you, you swear allegiance to the United <coughs> States and so on. And, mm -hmm. uh, there's a ceremony. Uh, one of the things that you learn very fast when you join the military is that you have to hurry up and wait. So having gotten there at 8 o'clock, my father took me over. Um, then what do you do? You, it's, it, you sit around, you wait, and then after a while, uh, they took us out uh, to a, a restaurant and, fe uh, and feed us uh, some lunch. And then we came back, and about sometime late in the afternoon, we got on a train and uh, proceeded to uh, proceeded to uh, St. Louis. Uh, was it a troop train or a regular train or what? Uh... Uh, it was. I think it was. I, I, I think it was a. I don't know whether it was a, a, a scheduled train or whether it was a special train. Uh, I, I think it was a, a, a regular train. I had some. Uh, I think I had some comments about the train there, but... Uh, I've heard uh, some people say they, they had transportation in a old World War I troop train, which was a, a very memorable old train if you... Well, I, I, had some, I had some later train uh, Let's see, we got off uh, about 6 p.m. Sunday evening from Minneapolis after sitting around for about eight hours. Well, it was more than eight hours if we'd gotten there at eight o'clock in the morning. We landed in the oldest railroad cars that the M and St. L could find. There was a very cautious engineer running the our train because we never went over 40 miles per hour. And we stopped every few minutes for no reason we could determine. When we got to St. Louis, we backed in and out of the station three times and stood for two hours before we started for Jefferson Barracks. Jefferson Barracks looks like a combination of the State Fair and a concentration camp. 
<laughs> so this is, was this where your basic training was done there? This is where the basic training was. Uh, uh, I had a, uh, I, this, uh, these notes are ones that I made a while back from my letters. My mother saved all my letters, and I was able to go through the letters and pick up some information. Do those letters still exist? Yeah, they're at the Minnesota Historical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I said there were 2,100 men living in where 700 were formerly intended to be. Sometimes we washed, but often the latrines are too full to get in. My mother had insisted that I go to start serving my country properly dressed in jacket, slacks, tie, shiny shoes, etc. I informed my mother about her mistake, in my, this is in my letter home, regarding my attire with the following. If you know any boy who is going to come down, tell him to wear old clothes, a warm jacket, and a pair of work gloves in his, put a pair of work gloves in his bag. He should have strong high shoes that will stand plenty of walking. In case you are worrying, I had better tell you that I am very happy. In fact, we really have a lot of fun here. Part of the fun was living in what we wore because the issue of uniforms didn't take place for about a week. <laughs> when I finally got my uniform, they gave me one shoe that was been, had been polished and the other one somebody had oiled, which always posed a problem because you're supposed to have your shoes shine. Uh, I wrote another letter March 6th, the, the previous one was February 28th. I wrote my brother uh, on March 6th. This is the damnedest camp I ever saw. We live in little huts that look like chicken coops. Everyone has sore throats and the hospital is so full you can't get in unless you have a temperature over 102 degrees. As long as they keep us busy, I don't mind it here because we are all going to get shipped out soon anyway. We thought. Uh, what what time of the year was this? This was March. That that was March six. March fifteen, I wrote. Uh, uh, this is a comment. My father, who had some contacts in the army, came down to visit and went to call on the post commander. He always believed it starting at the top. <laughs> Got escorted all over the camp by an officer and met the captain in charge of my unit. I got a pass to go to St. Louis and stay overnight in civilization. Needless to say, I felt a little strange and embarrassed about this parental presence. <laughs> March 18, Mom, I got the box of cookies and they they were they were real really popular. So, on, so we, we arrived down there in February, and on March 25, we wound up at Huntington, West Virginia. Now, did they do, like, they taught you to march and shoot oh, a gun? Oh, yeah, and all that, that. Okay. clean latrines. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basic training. Then you went to Virginia? Was, what, well, was then I went to Huntington, West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a... Uh, College training detachment at Marshall College, a little, uh, a little college down there. Our quarters were in a hotel in downtown Huntington. The hotel was about a mile from the campus of, uh, of the college. We were on the 12th floor and we were required to run all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> you got in good shape quickly then. Why did we? So. That now, was. can you explain? Um, did you take a like a, a test to get into the Army Air Forces, and then is that how you yeah. go, got into the College Training Detachment? There was the yeah. sequence. You you went to basic, and then you took a test, and then you went to the college, or was it another sequence? I don't, I don't recall. There must have been some test because it, because they obviously were trying to get people who could handle the. Uh, the college training and the fact that we were 
at the university, I guess, uh, and we were uh, taking courses, including the initial ROTC. I, I, that must have qualified us. Yeah. We also had to take a physical test, of course. And I took my physical uh, <clears throat> at, the, uh, at Fort Snelling. And that was an experience. Uh, the, uh, uh, I went there and we uh, all uh, were completely naked, uh, standing in a big line. <laughs> and uh, the, the, my, my uh, fellow testees were, were the moldiest looking bunch of guys. Some of them, had, uh, one fellow uh, near me had a, some horrible skin condition. That, uh, <laughs> and I couldn't understand what in the heck was going on. My mother, somehow or other, uh, got word through some friends that were in the draft board or something that they had been, the draft board had been getting a lot of complaints because they weren't sending enough people through or something and they had scraped up, <laughs> they had scraped up the, some real dregs and sent them out there. <laughs> and I don't know if there's any truth to that or not, but I remember that story. So this was before your induction during yeah, the draft Yeah, this was process. before I was yeah. inducted. Yeah. And they, 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 uh, they had, guys uh, uh, going through this line with people giving shots and, and drawing blood. I guess it was must, must have been, I don't know why they would have given us shots until we got into the service where we had a bunch of shots, but I think it was drawing blood. Uh, and, and some of these big old guys were passing out. <laughs> it was a real experience. <laughs> Something very memorable. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't pleasant at all. I mean, uh, so what did you make of the college training detachment period? Was that what well, that was an experience that? too. Uh, we uh, it was it was uh, a uh, very rigorous uh, existence. You uh, got up very early in the morning. You uh, uh, did a lot of calisthenics. Uh, we used to run vast distances, <laughs> and uh, uh, Huntington is is uh, on a on a flat uh, area a business district, and uh, is on on a flat area, and then near the river, uh, and uh, the Ohio River, and then uh, there are some quite high hills. Uh, a little further uh, back from the from the river, and uh, the uh, people in charge of this uh, college training detachment thought that it would be beneficial for us to run a lot, and on uh, and some of the running was up these hills, <laughs> and it was it it was uh, quite warm down there, uh, and. Uh, Unfortunately, some of the some of the fellows couldn't take this, and uh, one uh, and we also had another problem, and that was that uh, there had been a lot of sickness at Jefferson Barracks, uh, including uh, meningitis and uh, a lot of respiratory infection, and some of the boys uh, still had traces of that when they got down to West Virginia and one uh, a lad that was in the same room, they, they had a bunch of us in these hotel rooms, uh, like four or five guys in our like cots and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the uh, lads that was right near me uh, really got sick and they had to take him to a local veterans hospital and he passed away. Uh, so it, it, was, it was for real. Um, so we would exercise like mad all morning long, running, calisthenics, uh, all that sort of drilling around, you know, uh, uh, marching and stuff. And then we would go to classes in the afternoon. And uh, the problem was most of the guys would go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> they were tired. 
fired up. And we were <coughs> supposedly learning navigation and uh, uh, the, I'm trying to remember exactly what the courses were. Most of the time I was asleep anyway. Uh, so there was a lot some, of college level Yeah, physics college level. It right. was to prepare us for, uh, for later uh, training as pilots, navigators, uh, uh, bombardiers. How long was the program with the college training detachment? Well, months. let's see. I, uh, I must have gotten down there at the end of March, and uh, I, by the uh, 29th of uh, July, I was at San Antonio. Okay. So uh, San Antonio was a uh, was the place where they brought all these guys in, tested us and decided what our fate was going to be. Yeah. Uh, before we get to that, did you have any uh, like small flying experiences during the college training detachment? Yeah, we had, uh, uh, we had training uh, uh, in uh, Cub, no, Cub Air Place, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we sold, we, we had enough uh, training so that we could solo. So I, uh, uh, went through that and managed to land the plane and walk away <laughs> from it. <laughs> Did you like flying? Well, I, uh, I, I uh, thought it was an uh, interesting experience. In fact, I looked forward to someday me being able to have a, you know, fly uh, privately if I ever got out of the service. Yeah. Uh, it was a thrilling experience the first time you go into a spin. Mm -hmm. And you recovered and lived to tell about it? I came out of it. <laughs> I'm here to testify that I came out of that. Uh, but it was it was, it was an interesting experience. That was one of the better things about being in that college training detachment. Uh, did you uh, get to know the, like your roommates pretty well? and uh, Or did, did you get split up so quick you didn't really form well, a Well, we were split up. Uh, we, of course, we, we we knew the guys pretty well while we were there, but mm -hmm. I never saw them again after uh, uh, after being processed at San Antonio. Uh, so the classification process uh, at San Antonio was that extensive, or did they give you testing? They gave us a lot of tests. Uh, let's see, we got I got to uh, San Antonio. Uh, I said it, July 29. It's even before that, July 26. Uh, what, what year? It's 43. Well, wait a minute. I know it was 44. This was because I was called up in 43. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, I was called up in February of 43. Okay, correction, let's correct this again. This, this was still 43. And... Uh, so the testing, did that sort of give you some idea of what you're gonna be uh, classified to do? Yeah, they tell you what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you have any preferences uh, and, and at that And they point? decided that I was not material to be a pilot, navigator, or bombardier, and they uh, uh, and they, they they decided that I would be an aerial gunner, and we used to refer to the aerial gunners as aerial goners. <laughs> uh, so, what was uh, what was San Antonio like in terms of the base? Was it all temporary stuff, or was it a, actual buildings that? Uh, it, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, I think uh, built up at, at, at when the war started because we were in those w typical wooden barracks, mm -hmm. uh, two-story uh, barracks, and. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I, uh, I, I wasn't exactly wildly enthusiastic about uh, where we uh, wound up, but uh, you, you just do what you're told. And, so uh, from uh, San Antonio, once the classification was done, did they send you to a specialty training like gunnery school yeah, or something? Well, you, yeah, mm -hmm. you, but um, the military doesn't ever send you to just one place. They send you to multiple places. Mm -hmm. So I had already gone from Minneapolis to St. Louis to West Virginia, San Antonio, and from San Antonio, uh, where I was deemed to be unfit for uh, officer material, uh, <laughs> they, they sent us to uh, a place called Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, uh, and I, I wrote my family, dear family, why anyone would build an army camp in a place like this is beyond me. They have the most penetrating red sand that blows into everything. The dust is so thick that you often can't see the platoon leader until you, a lull comes in the wind. The water uh, is so bad that it is disgusting to drink, even when cold, and one can smell it running in the showers. I got KP for running out of a formation to avoid the red dirt dress, uh, drill field. We, they would march us out to this drill field, and if you're kind of at the back of the, of the formation, at, uh, whoever's uh, in charge doesn't see if you ran out. And so another guy and I ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we were playing chess uh, in the at the in the uh, in the second floor of the of the uh, barracks, and we were there were two rooms at the end of the uh, barracks uh, on each floor. There were two rooms for the uh, uh, NCOs to stay in. And we were in one of those rooms playing chess. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, we heard these voices. And it was some officers who were coming through to inspect, to make sure that everything was copacetic. And we heard the voices. And then they came up the stairs, boom, boom, boom. And then they were out in the, <laughs> they're out in the main area where all the guys, the regular GIs were, and then they, they were coming back, and darn if they didn't open the door, and there we were. <laughs> so we were assigned. Uh, we were uh, we were assigned uh, uh, KP for running out of formation, and uh, that, that wasn't as bad as it sounded because the the, the uh, mess sergeant who was in charge of the the, the place, the mess hall that we were assigned to, didn't have anything for us to do. So he told us to take a hose and go outside and scrub the outside of the mess hall. <laughs> so we spent the we spent a day or two squirting each other with a hose and having a good old time. And I'm going <laughs> to pause for just a minute for technical reasons. So you got caught and they put you on KP. Yeah, and after a day or two of KP, they, they, we were shipped out. And this time, uh, we went to Harlingen, Texas, which is right down uh, on the Mexican border. Uh, and uh, uh, Was that for gunnery training? That was school? for gunnery training. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, shot uh, skeet. And we shot 50 caliber machine guns, and we learned how to take the machine gun apart, uh, blindfolded or in the dark, and how to put it together again, <laughs> blindfolded and in the dark. And uh, 
And uh, did that take you a while to learn with all the parts in a machine gun? Uh, well, it, I can't remember just how long it took, but uh, we spent a lot of time doing it, and uh, you do it everything by the numbers. What do you mean? Well, you, one, you take something off, and two, you do the next operation, and three, you do, mm -hmm. and oftentimes uh, that's the way you learn to do things in the military. You do it by the numbers, you know. You, if you're going to make oatmeal by the numbers, you one, you take the pan and put it on the stove. Two, you put a cup of water in it. Three, you get the oatmeal out and measure a half a cup of oatmeal. Mm -hmm. Three, four, you put an eighth of a teaspoon of salt and water on, you know. And, and so you do it by the numbers, and that's the way it's done. And you don't have to think particularly. You just do it. You know? And in terms of, of working with these machine guns, the idea was if you had a jam and your gun didn't work or something, you could repair it without getting out the book or having to think very hard about it. Pretty good I saw a movie called, I think uh, it was called uh, Aerial Gunner, and I think they shot it at Harlingen, and they showed a, like a railroad thing that had a target that people would show, shoot at. Was yeah. that, was that? I don't remember the book. Uh, I'm sure there was something like that. I can remember shooting the 50 caliber machine guns, but I can't remember quite what I was shooting at. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the adventurous things was that they took us up in the AT-6 uh, airplanes, and we had a 30 caliber uh, machine gun, and they would tow a target, and we would pepper the target, and uh, the, uh, the ammunition for the 30 caliber machine gun, as I recall, was in a can like this, and they had to get the thing up there. And I remember fighting one of those things in the slipstream, and I damn near, I was having a hell of a time holding this thing, and if I'd let go of it, it could have gone back to taken the tail off the airplane, I believe. <laughs> Well, how, how did you get better over time doing all those different things using the skeet and the? I, I don't know that we uh, I don't know that we actually had a way of measuring uh, or if I you know it's, it's it's a lot of decades ago, but I'm sure we got better at at uh, at gunnery as we practiced. That was the whole idea is how to. Oh, and then we had uh, we had these. Uh, How do I describe the, uh, these uh, gun uh, guns that were uh, on a uh, where you shot at a screen? So it's uh, like a movie you're shooting. It's like a, yeah, mm -hmm. it seems to me that they call them something handy or something. Like that. Mm -hmm. Some of the more mentally alert. Guys could probably remember what more about how these things work, but you got into them. It was, it was like the the flight training deals, where where it's a uh, mock airplane, and the pilots could. So it was fly. a simulator that you'd it look at a movie. It was a simulator, and we would shoot at the screen, and you could tell whether you were hitting mm -hmm. anything or not, and how to lead, because. Obviously, when you're, you're you're shooting at a plane that's going by you like this, you've got to lead it by quite a bit mm -hmm. in order to uh, account for the time that it takes. Them. Had you had any background like being a hunter or anything before? Yeah, we. I'd done uh, quite a bit of shooting as a as a child. I mm -hmm. used to go hunting a lot. I was kind of a gun nut. And uh, so I had quite a bit of shooting experience, but I never shot a 50 caliber <laughs> machine gun before. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so we, 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 we trained with shotguns, we trained with actual 50 caliber guns, uh, and I, we probably did have moving targets at all, I don't remember that. Um, and we trained in the air with the, with, uh, 
shooting at targets that were towed by uh, another airplane. And some of the guys shot at donkeys or or uh, Mexican fishermen. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was, that off, was discouraged. Off of the, and, off of the and then some, some of the guys uh, went to Mexico. Uh, Matamoros was the town on the other side of the border, and uh, uh, did things which they shouldn't have done. And um, I won't go into details there, but I never went to Matamoros. And I had a better place to go. Uh, <clears throat> there was a family named Owens who uh, he uh, um, and. and uh, uh, contemporary, uh, my age, uh, Leo Owens, uh, had been injured as a boy. Uh, he'd gotten struck on the head and it caused him to be partially paralyzed. So he, uh, his father, owned uh, the local paper down there, I believe. And Leo and his sister invited me uh, on several occasions to come out and visit their home and and, uh, and I much preferred that to going to Mexico so mm -hmm. I, I, I did have that contact there in the, uh, in the Arlington, Arlington yeah. uh, I also learned that uh, in Harlingen, it seemed to me several times we uh, found out that if you don't uh, cook chicken properly or you cook chicken and you don't wash your hands before you do something else that you can get very sick. And so we had a couple of instances of stomach flu down there where everybody was really laid down uh, because of the improper handling of chicken. It always tied back to the chicken. <laughs> Did they uh, train you then with like the turning turret with the twin fifties in the gunnery school? Um, yeah, that I, was part I, of the training. Yeah, I, 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 now that you're mentioning it, I remember uh, they had mock-ups with the mm -hmm. with the uh, Where with the you... ball turret, the ball mm -hmm. turret uh, gun. Uh, the position, particularly, you had hydraulics that you had to use to turn the things. So they could put you in a sort of a mocked up uh, ball turret to they, learn uh, how to use the. They the tried turret. to. They tried to simulate the reality as best they could, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so. And the other thing that we had to learn was uh, aircraft identification. And we had, uh, and in fact, we had that training on even after we left Harlech, uh, because it, it, you, you can't uh, have too much experience in identifying aircraft. Uh, you, you, Some of them look you very want, similar. You don't want to shoot yeah. down your own plane. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so we had these. Uh, uh, pictures they would uh, project on a screen, and for very very short intervals, and you were you had to get so you could identify uh, the different airplanes, mm -hmm. ours and enemy airplanes. I've seen a, a little black outline of an ME 109, and then they put a P 51 Mustang, and they look pretty similar, except you know there's a scoop on the 51. I. Uh, I've never seen any numbers on this, but I am sure that a lot of our guys shot our guys down. I can't believe that that didn't happen. You can't turn people loose with shooting irons before somebody gets shot accidentally. And, and I know, in fact, I think in the video you gave me, it talked about a situation where a bomber dropped bombs and, and hit, hit a plane that was flying below them. If the, if the things, 
if the planes weren't in perfect formation, mm -hmm. it was awfully easy for that to happen. And I'm sure there's a lot of fellows that were shooting at a at a plane that was coming down. Uh, and here's another bomber. And if you don't stop shooting before uh, you hit the wrong plane. I'm yeah. sure that, that there must have been a lot of that. Um, so Harlingen, about how long was that training? Was that uh, like a few months worth? Well, let's see. We were... Well, let's see. Uh, November... I don't know that I could quickly work out just how long it was mm -hmm. that we were there. Well, where, where did you go next after? Was there an advanced school of some sort? Or well, the next, thing, the next thing after, uh, after Harlingen <clears throat> was uh, Salt Lake City. <laughs> you traveled all over the United States. <laughs> That's <this>. right. <laughs> Uh, I was, I, uh, I went home on a furlough uh, in November, November 7, and, uh, uh, and then, uh, then I went, I went back to Salt Lake City, that's where I, reported back uh, and I was there on Thanksgiving Day 1943 I spent the entire day washing metal six compartment trays in boiling water as hundreds of boys were fed turkey mashed potatoes stuffing sweet potato and pumpkin pie I eventually got my dinner after a very long day by the time I by that time, I couldn't feel much in my parboiled fingers. Why weren't there tongs to pick the trays out of the super hot water? I have pondered that question for 60 years. <laughs> I spent about a month doing nothing at much at Salt Lake, then was sent to Alexandria, Louisiana, arriving in December 3rd, having been assigned to an air crew we were to train as a crew in B-17s to prepare for the overseas duty. The winter was damp and rather chilly. I got a cold and turned into pneumonia. I went to a hospital where I was ordered to stay in bed. I sneaked out of bed to go to the toilet and a, nur and a nurse, and nurses were officers, and I was an enlisted man. The nurse caught me and made sure I obeyed her directions by ordering no pajama bottoms for me. <laughs> this tactic proved effective. <laughs> the crew I had been assigned to went on and I was reassigned to a new one on March 3rd. After returning from a leave to recover, I had been sick enough so that the Red Cross got in the act and suggested my folks come down. We spent some time recovering on the Gulf Coast. Uh, Gulfport is one of the areas that was affected by the unpleasantness they had down there a couple years ago. When I got back into training, I commented about the ground school we attended every day. Usually they give us three hours on something we already know or don't have to know or don't have enough background to understand. The movies that were shown to encourage better behavior with regard to the girls in town showed us information we already knew in full color. <laughs> <laughs> well now, uh, in terms of um, your, you graduated from the gunnery school, is that where they give you the gunnery? Uh, I guess we're authorized to, they wear the 
where the yeah. government. So is. you start out as a private in you know, basic, and then what, what do you remember what they paid you back then for before you got promoted? I uh, I can't remember exactly whether it was twenty one dollars or fifty dollars a month or something like that. Mm -hmm. You don't need much money. You you, you, <coughs> you can live on that because yeah. they were paying for everything. Yeah, in fact, a lot of a lot of guys sent some home. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was commenting. Uh, we were we were flying B seventeens out of this. Uh, uh, airport at Alexandria, Louisiana. A high point in the training experience was an occasion when the crew, including the pilots, were doping off with the radio uh, with the plane on autopilot and the navigator confused. I saw that we were retreating from the Gulf Coast and heading towards Central America. I recognized that there was a course problem and reported it on the intercom. I it turned out we were 180 degrees off. Nobody had noticed till I locked, looked out the side window, and we we could uh, I could see the coastline retreating, or we could have been one of the training planes that disappeared and never been found. So your crew needed to work on its navigation. Our navigator wasn't very alert, and the pilots were, they were, I think they were listening to the radio or something, a commercial radio, and they were doping around, and it, they were doing fine, except they were 180 degrees off, and we'd gotten out there, probably run out of gas, fallen in the drink, and that would have been it. I wrote several letters to my brother in which I described the degree of moral depravity among my fellow soldiers. <laughs> Not only did I find them corrupted, but I also described them as narrow-minded and ignorant. In the next letter, I would tell about, about the boys who were excellent chess players and others who would discuss current affairs. It was a fairly constant theme in my letters when I wasn't complaining about the living conditions in the camps. I actually learned over time that many of the boys had a lot of intelligence and skills that I lacked. They came from a different social class and I was learning that my feelings of superiority were unjustified. Several letters to my brother described my concern about our parents handling my, our exposure to combat and the possibility of one of us getting killed. I wonder if my brother sent those, I wondered if my brother sent those off to parents immediately since I was communicating feelings I didn't want to share with them. And, and it's dawned on me uh, in recent times how traumatic it must have been for my family all the families of, of these guys because it was well known that uh, you know a, a, about 25 percent of these uh, fellows in airplanes never come back mm -hmm. they were they were the Germans were dropping these planes right and left and that was you know in the news and everything so imagine as a parent how you feel if you if you're Family members are out there, and that's an excellent, you know, one chance, or even that you're not going to come back. Mm -hmm. Were there news stories coming back from uh, things like the Schweinfurt raid, where they lost uh, 60 planes in one raid, and all those? I don't know what the public was told, mm -hmm. yeah. but I, I I can't believe that it wasn't known. Casualty rate was really high. Did you uh, get assigned uh, immediately to a position on the airplane, or did you like rotate to be among the gunnery positions, or were you? How did you end up being the ball turn? I wasn't. I okay. was. A, I was a waste gunner. Mm -hmm. A term which has several meanings. <laughs> <laughs>
so I, I don't know exactly how that was decided. The smallest guy, and I didn't bring the picture of the crew, but the smallest guy was in the ball turret. Mm -hmm. uh, a fellow from Grundy Center, Iowa. And uh, the ball turret was the most miserable place to be. Were you, um, when you went overseas, did you stay with the same crew you were learning how to yeah, operate the plane the, with? The, the crews basically stayed together, although sometimes they would assign somebody, if there was a shortage in some other crew, they, they, they would take a guy from here and put him over there. Mm -hmm. and the, 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 the fellas that I was with the, the day I got hit were a sort of little bit mixed crew. The radio mm -hmm. operator was a guy that we'd never been mm -hmm. with before, and he was killed. Did you have memorable crew members, uh, the other guys that were on the crew, uh, that you, and the ones that were the regular crew members? Yeah, well, a lot of these air crews got to be really very close, but uh, that, that wasn't my experience. I don't know exactly why. I, we all knew each other and, and so on, but I, I never developed a real close friendship with any of them. Uh, I, I only had nine missions, or ten. I gotta check that out. Uh, so maybe I didn't get a chance to uh, become as close to the guys as some of the air crews that uh, stayed together longer. And perhaps went through even more traumatic experiences than I did. Uh, so from Louisiana, what was your next? Uh... Okay, we were in Louisiana. And from Louisiana, they sent us on uh, to Kearney, Nebraska, which was a staging point for the crews uh, being sent overseas. Um, and I comment, that's, uh, uh, this letter was uh, May 10, 1944. Uh, this isn't such a bad place. The food is better than Alexandria. Uh, and uh, besides, it's out of the south, which is enough to make me happy. The trip, is fair, the trip was fairly good as GI trips go. Some of the boys got oil and threw eggs at people in Kansas City. I don't remember that at all. It just told me. But I, it was in my letter, so mm -hmm. it must have been. However, the rest of the trip was uneventful. Most crews leave here by plane. Others travel by train or ship. I told my family I couldn't tell them where I was, what we were doing, or where we were going to go from there. We were shipped to New Jersey in double-deck rail cars, somewhat like trucks used to ship sheep or pigs. In Newark, we were loaded on a stripped-down British passenger ship named the Rangatana. There were so many of us crowded on it that most would never have been able to get off if we had been torpedoed. A British crewman told me that when they hauled British troops, they loaded more on. We were in the middle of a convoy with tankers and merchant ships all around us. It was comforting to see the destroyers circling the convoy looking for submarines. How did you uh, how did you do crossing the Atlantic? Did you get seasick or did, was it okay? No seasick, <coughs> just dirty. Mm -hmm. We walked in we walked in on our with the clothes we had on, and 14 days later we walked off. <laughs> <laughs> the only I, 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 it was a, a grubby situation. Uh, they had us jammed in uh, these sort of compartments, and there would be 
a table with benches on each side. And they, we were all sitting on the benches, just jammed in as tight as we could get with our duffel bag on the table. And uh, then they took our duffel bags away from us in there. So all we had was what we had on in our mess kit. And somebody stole my mess kit, so all I had was the cup and the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> We jammed us in there, and then to then to sleep, some guys slept on the table, some guys slept on the deck, and some guys slept on hammocks that were, were up, hanging up above. Wow. Did they ever let you up on the deck to yeah, walk around Yeah, we went up exercise? on the deck, and, and uh, everybody wanted to get out of there as much as they could, so we would go up on deck in the daytime. And, uh, and then... Uh, some guys were assigned to help in the officer's mess, and they stole canned goods and stuff and brought it down. And uh, we, they issued us, for some reason, they issued us a, sort of a short bayonets, where everybody had these bayonets. And in order to open the cans, you had to use your bayonet. Guys were cutting themselves all the time. And then I think uh, some characters got into disputes with the knives, so I think they took them away from us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a little bit vague about that. but uh, Did you run into any problems with submarines, or were they keeping those no, away? We, by, the time, by that time, I think they had the Germans a little bit calmed down. They were still sinking ships, but I, we didn't have any problem that I was aware of. If, you know, uh, and uh, so we were went we went to Newark. We got loaded on the Rangitata. We landed in Liverpool on the first of June. Now that was just five days before the invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were routed to a gunnery camp on the wash. Actually, they sent us to an interim place for a, a few days, and, and uh, then, then we were put on a train, and we went to this gunnery school that's on, on a sort of a, it was east, east side of England, and it's sort of a swampy area, and it was not far from Sandringham, where uh, the royal family have a big farm, a uh, large estate. But, it, but uh, and how uh, we uh, we fooled around there with more gunnery practice and more uh, aircraft identification and so on. Uh, uh, it was a kind of a primitive place, uh, but uh, I. We finally arrived July 1st at our ultimate destination, the 91st Bomb Group base at Bassingbourne, uh, which I, and this is wrong, I said it was just southwest of Cambridge, but it was obvious. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a, here's a map Maybe of the, all the bases, and uh, uh, you need to look at it. You need to uh, make well, a final well, let's see. They, they, they're not showing where the, uh, here, here's Bassingborn, but they don't show cities on this mm -hmm. map. So well, so it's it sort of due north of London. Due north of London, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah there isn't a scale here, but uh, it, it, you, could ride, you could ride from uh, right near Bassingborn. There was a train station uh, a few miles south of Bassingborn, and you could ride your bike down there and catch a train right into London. Was the 91st all by B-17s? Yeah. The 91st was all B-17s. Uh, and the, the good news about Bassingbourne was that it had been uh, it had been a permanent RAF field. How we got it from the RAF, I don't know. But the barracks uh, were all brick, two-story barrack, brick buildings 
and uh, a lot of the other buildings were permanent type buildings. Uh, whereas an awful lot of the bases were Quonset huts and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. This was a pretty civilized place. Mm -hmm. And uh, being near Cambridge also in, uh, was a civilizing factor for me because I go into Cambridge and sit near the, uh, one of the colleges and talk to people who were uh, with the university and so on. So it was a way of escaping the military. Um, so anyway, we arrived there as a, at Liverpool on the 1st, and then eventually, oh, a month later, we arrived at the, at the 91st Bomb Group passing point. Uh, and it was an interesting thing being near Cambridge. Uh, you, of course, you, you in no way were you supposed to reveal to your family where you were. I mean, you could tell them you were in England, but that was supposed to be about as far as you'd go. <clears throat> but uh, when I had been uh, with my family, I had been in Cambridge in 1938, and. Uh, there's a little river, the River Cam goes through, right through Cambridge, right through where the colleges are and so on. And the, uh, one of the indoor and outdoor sports there in, at, at uh, Cambridge is uh, to go punting on the Cam, a punt being a flat bottom boat with a, uh, you can stand in the back of it and they pull these things up. And my dad uh, was pulling the, the punt and the, got the pole stuck in the mud and fell in the river. <laughs> so I was able to violate all rules of military secrecy by telling a fictitious story about falling off the back of a punt. This had occurred to my father in 1938 when we were tourists in Cambridge. With this hint, my family learned where I was stationed. If it hadn't been for the war, my stay in England would have been very pleasant. Not only was it enjoyable to bike into Cambridge and hang around the ancient university, but I had various relatives that I was able to visit, bearing canned goods, powdered eggs, and cigarettes. Uh, these provisions assured a hearty welcome. <laughs> Uh, on one occasion, another boy and I went to London and visited some of the tourist sites. With a shortage of troops after the invasion, the prostitutes were extremely aggressive, an example which I cited several years later in an economics class as a perfectly unregulated free market where supply and demand determine price. On another occasion, I was the guest of a wife of a conservative MP, Lady Sykes. At one point, she showed me her chickens, which she kept in the garden so as to convert scraps into eggs. The garden had belonged to Neville Chamberlain, the guy with the umbrella who had promised peace in our time after conferring with him. It paid me uh, to know the right people. Too bad Chamberlain didn't know Hitler better. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you have a camera or take any pictures or anything during this? Uh, I had a camera and I took a few pictures, but very few, and it, mm -hmm. they don't show really much of anything. I have some pictures of several of us uh, sitting outside the barracks. and. Uh, I don't know. You always look back on your life and you wonder why you didn't take more pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I should at some point ask you your unit. So we're in the United States Army Air Forces, the eighth U.S. 8th Air Force, 91st Bomb Group, and then what squadron? Do you remember the squadron no, number? I, I, 
I, I'm doing well to remember there was the 91st Bond Group. <laughs> Actually, I, I have a rubber stamp with my with my uh, uh, old designation on it. So, so I, if I if I forget, I can always get my rubber stamp out. Mm -hmm. Then I, uh, so we fooled around there at Bassingborn for a while. Uh, they had us assigned to rolling up some barbed wire and doing things like that. And then they finally got, we finally got around to actually uh, getting in the airplanes and flying, uh, flying on missions. Uh, I said, I, I didn't start flying missions until August 9th. I will always recall the sensation of watching for the first time the black puffs of anti-aircraft fire which appeared as we flew over some coastal islands. This was my initial experience with the reality that people on the ground were trying to kill us. That's a, it's a kind of a stirring thought. Were you uh, apprehensive or scared when, you, when, when you'd go up in these planes and yeah, on I was, these missions? I think you're a damn fool if you aren't scared. I mean, how can, how can you sit there with somebody shooting at you and not be scared unless you're some kind of a kook? Uh, we were supposed to fly to Munich. And one of the, one of the guys, uh, our tail gunner, uh, was kind of a joker and he referred to his luncheon for luncheon. <laughs> but we never got there because of heavy clouds over central Germany. We got lost and separated from the formation. The plane came back with many holes in it from flak, which we encountered wandering up the Ruhr Valley. We, everybody else turned this way and we turned that way. Hmm. <laughs> See, we were in the, in the midst of the clouds. Was that the first mission you went on? Yeah. We dropped our bomb load somewhere in Germany to get rid of the dangerous explosives. It's bad enough to have a whole lot of gasoline, but bombs too, you don't need uh, double jeopardy, you might say. Uh, and to reduce the weight of the plane. When I got on the ground, I pondered being a cook instead of a gunner. <laughs> Mission two, August 11, was an attempt to hit some German gun emplacements at Brest. The photos showed our bombs landing in the water, not on the guns. The ride back to England was spectacular. The weather was perfect and the whole southwest part of England was in front of us like a giant map. I can still remember that. It went up to where the pilots were and I could look out. Here's, here's Cornwall and Land's End and mm -hmm. the Bristol Channel and the whole thing right in front of us. It's just, just great. Mission 3, August 15, was to bomb an airfield four miles east of Cologne. It was a combined RAF and U.S. effort. The clipping I saved said 2,000 planes took part in hitting the remaining German airfields. I saw some completely bombed out fields that we passed over. On this day, the Allies landed in southern France. It's amazing how little I was aware of what was going on in, in the landing. Uh, you know, we weren't directly involved in it. Mission 4, August 24, the target was an airfield near Leipzig. Now that's a long way over. The bombs landed on the concrete aprons and some hangars. On the way back, we saw Hanover on fire, as well as many other cities burning. I noted that I felt nervous and my stomach bothered me. Uh, mission 5, August 26, the target was a synthetic oil plant near Essen. 
there was a lot of haze and the bombardier had to guess at the aiming point. The German gunners couldn't get the range, fortunately. One of our planes caught fire, but the crew managed to get out under, get it under control. There was some of the 105 millimeter white flak, more potent than the 88 millimeter black type. The bombardier could only guess at the aiming point. In mission 6, September 11, 44, the target was a synthetic oil plant near Nuremberg. Out of bed at 5.15, I replaced a grounded gunner in a strange crew, got to the plane about 6 and took off at 7.34. The uneventful trip to the target bombed visually through the woolly clouds. Results are very doubtful. The radio reported a great air battle over this area, but I didn't see any fighters. We passed over the Rhine on the way back way back out and had an extremely close call with some flak. About six bursts were shot at us just after we crossed the river. Jerry was extremely accurate and almost every shot rocked the ship. I didn't record the time of return. So you kept notes of each of the missions? Yeah, I've got a notebook that's in the Historical Society. I, I, had, a, a, I had a notebook and made notes, and then I also drew little maps of the places. And I, I should have made copies of it before I gave it to the Historical Society, but I could go in and get it back any time, I suppose. In Mission 7, September 26, 1944, Target marshalling yard at Osnabrück, O S N A B R U C K. Took off at 1100 and went on course at 1300, had about 50% ground cover. We had a tailwind of about 50 knots, which blew us over the target at about uh, three, 300 uh, miles per hour ground speed, reached the target at 1430, and were back over the coast about 1600. Dropped bombs at 27,000 feet, had only about half a dozen guns firing at us, only fairly accurate. As we left the coast, we had a few bursts of very accurate flak and got a hole in the horizontal stabilizer. See, the German Air Force, by the time I got over there, was pretty much out of, literally and figuratively out of gas. They didn't have the planes, they didn't have the fuel, and, they, and I, I imagine they had a severe shortage of pilots, too. Mission number eight, September 27, factory and marshalling yards at Cologne, up at four, and were rushed to get our stuff out to the ship ready for stations at 5, went on course at 8.30, had cloud cover over entire route, bombed by dropping on smoke bombs that were uh, uh, located by radar, got back about 13.30 to 1.400, flak was light but very accurate. Everything fi went fine until we got to the target. Neither the, ch the chaff, that's uh, aluminum, little aluminum strips that we dropped out. Of the For the, the radar jamming? To, to mm -hmm. screw up the radar, yeah. Neither the chaff or cloud cover did any good. They still had us every time. Some flak was of the dreaded white type, uh, bigger guns that had the the white uh, smoke. Everything went fine until we got to the target. Neither chaff nor cloud cover did any good. They still had us every time. Some flak was of the dreaded white type. Our ship was pretty well holed. Most of the hydraulic fluid had leaked out by the time we got home. The controls on, the, on number one and two engines were shot out, and the engineer had to control them by pulling cables behind the instrument panel. 
I don't fully understand how that worked. We had a, a, the waste windows rigged for a parachute stop if the brakes were completely out. We got, we were glad to get home. Could you explain uh, the, how the waste window would be used? You threw the parachute out if you had no way to stop on the runway? Is that what you mean? Yeah. I don't <clears throat> quite know how, how we could. We, by the time I got over there, they had plexiglass windows. When they, earlier, uh, when they were first over there, they had no windows and the air was cold air was blowing in and mm -hmm. they soon found out that... Um, that was, can you describe a little bit about the working conditions? I, I understand it was really cold and you had uh, oxygen and those kinds of things? Yeah, well we had to, we, we put on oxygen masks when we got to 10,000 feet. And, uh, and we had uh, heated suits. Uh, it was sort of like blue long underwear with the with little wires in them like a, like a blanket. And, uh, and then we had the woolly, you know, the sheepskin coats and pants and the boots and everything. And um, the, uh, so at least for those of us from Minnesota, it, it didn't seem that bad. You know? <laughs> the southern guys thought it was horribly cold and everything, but, uh, and, and it, it was, you know, get up that high, uh, and all you got is, isn't like a passenger plane nowadays, all you had is just a aluminum cylinder that you were in. Mm -hmm. Did they have helmets or anything, flak vests or anything? Yeah, we had flak, flak vests that we could wear. I, I'm not sure whether we just didn't put them on the floor or on the, the stand on them or just what, but part of it, I can't remember too, but I do remember very well, we had, uh, from my position, we could uh, wear our, hel our parachute, you know, snapped on, or, or let it hang on one side and bring it up and snap it over here if, it, if you were going to jump out. What door would you have gone out if you had the bail? Well, if, if uh, we had the door that, um, that opened out side of the plane. Mm -hmm. So what we would do in our position, we would open that door and drop out. The, the people up forward had another door up there. Mm -hmm. And the ball turret gunner, if he couldn't make his ball rotate up so he could open the door, he was screwed. He couldn't get out under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that happened sometimes. Now, facing forward, were you on the right or the left, or did you switch off? I, it seems to me I was, uh, was always on the right side. There was a guy named Moran who, from Minneapolis who was on the other side. And, uh, so you had two Twin Cities uh, yeah, gunners. two Twin Cities, and our, our tail gunner was a guy from uh, uh, Livingston, Montana. Our ball turret guy was from Grundy Center, Iowa. Our pilot was from uh, Sioux City, South Dakota, and uh, he, w he wanted to name our plane the Stubble Jumper. <laughs> <laughs> I should have asked that. Did, did your, uh, was your plane named or did it have a... Stubble Jumper. And was there any nose art or anything? Or? Could have been. I can't. But I'm, I'm foggy on that. and, and uh, I'm not sure that we always flew in the same plane. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our navigator was a guy named Zepkowitz, and he was from Chicago, I believe. And then we had an engineer who was behind the pilots and helped with the engines and so on, and, and had, a, had a gun up on top of the plane. A fellow named Nagy, and he was from uh, Right outside of Chicago, where the, uh, the the city where they had a whole bunch of uh, steel mills. Uh, Gary, he was from Gary, Indiana. 
And um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to him a little later. Um, I can't remember where our navigator come from. Well, no, he was Zepkowitz, the bombardier, rather. I can't remember anything about him. But, but now we're coming to mission. Um, I'm going to stop just for a moment for technical reasons here. Change the battery. Hey, is that thing? Well, the battery on the, the video camera really goes forever. It's like 800 minutes. I told you about yeah. these little parts in this hearing aid, didn't I? Yeah, just amazing. God, the stuff they can do nowadays. But we can't figure out how to provide medical care for people. Yeah. We could do all these incredible things. I think we were talking about you had gotten up to your, your ninth mission. Or did we cover everything with the eighth? I think we were coming up to the ninth. We covered the eighth. I said we were from the, I, I remarked at the end of that that uh, the, we had the parachutes rigged. If we had to uh, use them because the brakes uh, might fail. I also remarked that we were glad to get back. Uh, mission number nine was September 30th, 44, and the target was a rail bridge and marshalling yards at Munster. We took off at 1022 and returned at 1400. Flew with strange crew as a spare gunner. There was an almost complete overcast and we bombed by PFF. And I'm not sure what PFF was. I assume it was by radar. Mm -hmm. But maybe some of the other 8th Air Force guys who were a little more alert than I was would know what that meant. Everyone seems to agree that we were off target by about 15 miles. <laughs> so much for precision bombing. Some crowd must have been surprised when all of the thousand pounders landed in his field. This was an effort to cut German communications to the area where British troops were fighting in Holland. Uh, then I come to uh, my last effort, which was mission number 10, October 15, 1944, marshalling yards at Cologne. See, it was getting to be increasingly important to try to try to cut the German communications as we, as our people were coming across toward the Rhine. <clears throat> and I comment that this account was written some days after the events when I was in the hospital recovering from surgery. Took off at six o'clock in a PFF ship. Now I. I'm pretty sure that what that meant uh, was that that plane had a radar unit and could drop bombs and other planes could then drop uh, at the same spot. We crossed the enemy co coast uh, south of Flushing. Later we turned and ran on a course roughly parallel to the Rhine. About 15 minutes from the target we got some very heavy flak that must have come from along the river. We got some hits on the wings and tail. As we got to the uh, uh, IP, that initial point where you go on the bomb run, the flak became very accurate. 
The first burst got me and killed the radio operator. It also knocked out the oxygen back of the bomb base and took most of the control cables out. Butch, he was the tail gunner, came out of the tail just as a, as a burst tore through where he'd been sitting. He was a big guy and to get to that tail position he had to crawl through this sort of a tunnel. Uh, I found myself on my back looking at my foot, which was a mess. The other waist gunner, a boy from Minneapolis named Mike Duran, hooked me up to an emergency oxygen tank. I could see, feel, and hear the flak bursting all around us. A lot was raining against the ship and some came in and stung my legs. I kept on the we kept on the bomb run for what seemed hours. Then finally the bombs fell and the ships banked off to the right. The flak petered out in a few minutes and we didn't have any more the rest of the way back. We dropped down almost immediately to low altitude and the boys started fire, test firing their guns. I don't know uh, whether they uh, were test firing because my, uh, I, I don't know uh, uh, why they were test firing because my interphones were, weren't hooked up and I was sure we were under attack. Some of the boys took off their flag suits and put on parachutes and by that time I was getting scared. Finally, I saw a P-51 buzzes and my courage was better. In the meantime, the Mickey operator had wrapped up my foot and given me morphine. We had those little morphine surrettes that uh, you could stick it in a guy's arm or something and give him a shot. My foot felt as uh, though it was in a bucket of ice water and the pain was rather unpleasant. I, I took a look at it and could see uh, toes hanging off to one side. In spite of this, I didn't feel the least bit faint. I couldn't help but think with some relief that the war was over for me anyway for a few months. <clears throat> there had been so much confusion when the flak hit that the actual wound didn't bother me particularly. There was a lot of fur flying around that came out of my boots. We got hit about 9 o'clock and at 9.30 when we got to France the boys asked me if I wanted to go to a hospital in France or one in England. I felt it would be much better to go home to Bassingbourne and said so. By 11.45 we were back at the base. We landed with a flat tire and no brakes, which gave us a rough landing, most of, most of it off the runway. Planes with wounded on board fired a flare out of a window, which signaled the need for an ambulance, which we called meat wagons. As uh, it took us five about five or six minutes for the ambulance to come, and from then on my journey was planned by the medical corps. By this time the morphine was working and there was little real pain, just a cold feeling. About an hour later I was in the operating room. On October 17 I wrote a letter home indicating that I had received a little wound in one foot and that I would be up and walking around in a week or so. I assured my folks that I was getting excellent care and there was nothing to be concerned about. My family enlisted one of my English relatives to visit the hospital to check on my story. A distant, cover, a distant cousin of my mother's made a very time-consuming trip from Nottingham to accomplish this verification that I was okay. 
After being shipped back to the United States, I received a discharge from the Army on 3845. After a lot of waiting around for no reason, since my wound had healed completely by January. Uh, <clears throat> then I, I describe a, a, a strange uh, coincidence. Um, a few days after getting wounded, I learned that my fellow crew members had been shot down in Germany. It was after the war in Europe had ended that I got some details of their experience. The entire crew was able to get out of the plane and parachute safely to ground. One boy had insisted on carrying a 45 automatic. They'd issued us 45s, but most of us didn't carry them. This was a kind of a, a pugnacious guy from Spruce Pine, Alabama. Um, he had um, very definite ideas about uh, black people, which was kind of repulsive. He was an aggressive southern boy from Spruce Pine, Alabama. He was extremely prejudiced about blacks and called slingshots nigger shooters. I haven't told that to our fellow Discussion member. Yeah, probably best left out of the conversation. <laughs> Although I think he'd understand if I told him about it, because I'm sure he's. Uh, on landing, he waved the 45 around and was killed by the Germans. The other boys wound up in a prison camp located in what was then Pomerania. I was struggling for that word, Pomerania, now part of Poland. At this point, I want to make the connection uh, between Otto von Bismarck, German invasions of European conquest, if not world domination, leading to the First World War, the stupid Treaty of Versailles, the economic chaos followed by Ed Reed's father's uh, following, and Ed Reed's father's nursery business, then located in St. Paul. Uh, the gardener, farm manager on my family's place, and my crew members in the prison camp. The Bismarck family estates were located in Pomerania, which is in east, uh, which is east of Berlin. My family's longtime employee, Frank Kloss, was a child on one of the Bismarck farms where his father was in charge of workhorses. After World War I, thanks to the Versailles Treaty, and the general devastation of, in Germany, Ed Reed's father was able to get a number of young German workers to come to St. Paul to work for his family business, the Park Nursery. These people were hard workers, eager to escape the conditions in Germany. There were uh, leading, there were uh, already relatives settled in Dakota County, the West St. West St. Paul in South St. Paul. The transition to America was not difficult and since the men were excellent workers trained in groundskeeping, Ed's father became a source of employees for some of his customers. Frank was one of the Park Nursery graduates who was employed by my father to maintain our home place. I spent most of my youth with him learning about care of horses and cattle, hay, beekeeping, and how to dig ditches in clay soil. My father worked many hours, including half Saturday, half days on Saturday, and didn't get home until dinner time most days. The price of business leadership was the loss of family companionship. While my crewmates were in the prison camp, they were able to communicate with the guards, one of whom was Frank's father. By the time he must have been very elderly. It is not hard to figure out how the conversation went. I have a son who lives in Minnesota and works for a family named Barrett, etc., etc. One of the crew, the ball turret gunner, named Holman from Grundy Center, Iowa, 
came to visit after the war and told us the story. He also told me that one of the boys was too eager to get away from the Germans as the Russians approached. He took off for the Russian lines and was never heard from again. The others walked west to the Allied lines and returned to the U.S. Had I not been wounded, I could easily have been a prisoner of war guarded by Frank's father. Looking back, I realize how fortunate I was. Even though I was wounded, I had far less exposure to the extreme combat conditions that many uh, others endured. My military career consisted of long periods of relative boredom, followed by short intervals of terror. I'm not sure I ever fired my guns at an enemy plane. By the time I was flying over Germany, the Luftwaffe was pretty well destroyed. The Germans had a few jets, which could have been extremely dangerous, but they were too few and too late. I uh, always seemed to have a safety net wherever I went. After I was discharged, I apologize, I had a technical problem with the tape running out. Go ahead, let's back up a sentence or two. Okay, looking back, I realize how fortunate I was. Even though I was wounded, I had far less exposure to extreme combat conditions than many others. My military career consisted of long periods of relative boredom, followed by short intervals of terror. I'm not sure I ever fired my guns at an enemy plane. By the time I was flying over Germany, the Luftwaffe was pretty well destroyed. The Germans had a, a few jets, which could have been extremely dangerous, but they were too few and too late. I always seemed to have a safety net wherever I went. After I was discharged, I now realize that, like many other servicemen and women, there was an overpowering feeling of now what? The toughest thing was to figure out what to do having trained it in shooting 50 caliber machine guns and then after some time going to college, the Army recommended that I was best suited as being a route man. A route man goes around and, and delivers things to stores and takes the order for the next shipment and so on. At the end of my talk, uh, I delivered this talk before, at the end of the, my talk there were some questions and I had a chance to describe why I had been so disgusted by the opinion of some boys that the war in Europe wasn't our problem and that the British could deal with it. If the British lost, so what? I explained that, that as a child I had traveled to England with my family, that we had a number of English relatives and that I had seen the moving pictures of the bombing of London. In addition, I had been very much influenced by the famous Churchill speech, which included the lines about fighting on the beaches, fighting on the landing grounds, and fighting in the fields, etc. These things had had a profound effect on my idealistic adolescent mind. There was at that time a degree of patriotic fervor that hasn't been equaled since, even after 9-11. The enemy was real. And I had a, a few remarks here that sort of summarize my feelings about war. I have arrived at these conclusions when I think about military experience. War exceeds anything else as the all-time greatest waste of resources, both human and material. Production of the trappings of war have been the motivation for many technological advances. War and weapons of war are fascinating to most people in all societies. We could have incredible advancements in human well-being if the materials and efforts devoted to human aggression could be channeled to cons cons uh, constructive works. Aggression seems to be inherent in the human psyche. So that's, that's, good. that's my war experience.
When you uh, returned, did you come back on a ship or did they fly you home? I came back on a hospital ship. Now you had a pretty severe injury. Did you uh, lose a lot of blood, or did they like uh, in the airplane? Did they have to like wrap this tight to keep you from bleeding? They put tourniquets on my leg. Mm -hmm. And then wh which leg was it that you had? Uh, it's it's my, uh, my right leg, and I basically, if this is my foot, I lost the whole front part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've known you for quite a while now, and I've never, I would never have known that. So you must be able to move around okay with the. The, basically the amputation of the front of your, yeah, yeah, look at that, <laughs> yeah, so the front of your shoe, do you have to have special shoes or anything? Or? I did for a long time, yeah. I had a wonderful shoemaker named Lind, and uh, he had a, a, a little factory uh, on, West, on East 7th Street. And he made my shoes for quite a long time, uh, and they were uh, very excellent shoes, and, and I would get a lot of life out of them, because when they, when they needed repair, I'd take them back and he'd rebuild them. Uh, make a long story short, uh, uh, he was uh, in, in Stillwater for a while, and his son took over the business, they moved over to, to Somerset, uh, and the, basically they were making bowling shoes, the son wasn't interested in orthopedic shoes, the father died, uh, they sent my lass to a place in uh, New Jersey or someplace in the East, the shoes, they, I got one pair of shoes from them that are not satisfactory and I quit using the government shoes. I just buy the Chinese shoes and I, I get along fine with them. I just mm -hmm. stuff newspaper in the, uh, in mm -hmm. the front part. So you don't really need a prosthetic with the, the way that no, it No, one reason that it took me a long time to get discharged from the Army uh, was that uh, they wanted to make a uh, stainless steel uh, thing that would fit my foot and hold the uh, hold the shoe in position. It was a miserable thing. The guy that uh, uh, was going to pound this thing out to make him was on leave for a while. So I sat around out at uh, 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 what the military thought was the closest station to my home, uh, Brigham City, Utah. Uh, I, I, Going back, I landed uh, from the hospital ship uh, on Staten Island, and they had a military hospital there. And the guys said, uh, the people said, "Well, you know, you're from Minnesota. We'll send you to the place closest to your home, mm -hmm. Brigham City, Utah." <laughs> I thought that was close. Characteristic of the Eastern <coughs> mind. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> if it's west of the Hudson, it doesn't really exist until you get to California, mm -hmm. the great flyover country. But anyway, uh, so I was out there in Brigham City, Utah, waiting to get discharged, and they goofed around and goofed around, and because the guy who was going to pound out this miserable piece of stainless steel, I don't know if I still have it or not, but, uh, he went on leave and then came back, had to make this thing, and, and it went on and on and on. And finally, about March, I uh, I told the folks, I said, "Listen, I got to go home. My dad, uh, we got this farm. You know, uh, he needs help, you know, mm -hmm. which was a bunch of BS." <laughs> but <laughs> so, so I finally achieved uh, getting my uh, discharge, and, and uh, they gave me. 300 bucks or something, and a ticket, and I came home on the, on the uh, train. Well, now the, the flag came from below the airplane and went up. Yeah, so it if went you had right been, through the airplane. If you had been standing just a little. If I'd been standing six inches one way or the other, I wouldn't even be here from that. Because mm -hmm. it would have, you know, it would, and, and the radio operator uh, wasn't as fortunate. He, was killed instantly. Mm -hmm. At 
why it didn't hit anybody else, I don't know, because the plane was pretty well shot up. The, on the first mission we went on, we came back, and that plane had holes all over it. And I, as I, I have a vague recollection that they just used it for salvage parts. Did you keep any uh, souvenirs from, like, flak pieces or anything like that? No, I didn't. I didn't get any flak pieces, but I, I, the only souvenir I've got is an empty 50 caliber mm -hmm. cartridge, uh, which uh, I've got. So that was um, uh, your discharge before, uh, like, the end of the war, VE Day and VJ Day, or was that, that was much later. That was later. Yeah. So um, I was discharged in, I think it was March. I could have, I should have maybe brought my, I got a copy of the discharge. And Where were you when you heard the war was over? And what, what do you remember I was, about that? Uh, well, there again, I was sitting at home. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, well, I'm thinking of maybe... What are two, I'm, I'm two confusing, VE and I'm VJ. confusing when Roosevelt died and when the war was over. Yeah, April was, I think it was April 12th, 45 or something, when Roosevelt passed, or he had a stroke and died. I can remember, I, I, well, I guess I better say, I, honestly, I can't remember exactly when I heard the war was over. I know mm -hmm. when, uh, when the European war was over. But we were still fighting in Japan, mm -hmm. and my brother, <coughs> uh, being in the Navy, was probably going to be assigned to the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we actually, uh, uh, I was with my family uh, up on Saginaw Lake uh, uh, at a little fishing camp up there, and. Uh, had a, a little radio run with, with uh, doorbell batteries, <laughs> and we heard about the uh, dropping the bomb in, uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. the, the bombs. Yeah. Strangely enough, there was a guy at, uh, I don't know if he's still there or not, but I, uh, there was a fellow at Boutwell who uh, was in a fighter plane up way above the bomber that dropped the, the, the one of those atomic bombs uh, because he was uh, guarding the plane in case the Japanese had some fighter planes. So he probably saw the explosion. And he saw the explosion and of course they got the hell out of there. Do you know what his name is? Uh, no, I'd have to go to the one of the pastors there who uh, got several of us together, and I, I, I'm not a great name retainer. I have a hell of a time. So after the war, then what what did you do? And let me just uh, take a pause moment to get the technical camera going. So after the war, what did you do? Well, I, in, in my little uh, uh, description here, I, I mentioned that the problem is you, you, you come out of the military and then you have this fast feeling of now what? Well, the now what is easily solved by going to college for a while. And of course, we had the GI Bill. And mm -hmm. So I, I went to college and, and uh, got a degree in uh, Social psychology, a very useful subject, particularly if you uh, want to go ahead to graduate school, and, um, you know, and maybe there's some possibilities. But I didn't. I'd had it up to here with schooling. I've never been wildly enthusiastic. Have you ever been school. back to see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of my roommates uh, in college was a wonderful English fellow. Uh, David Lane by name, and um, he, uh, he uh, I've, I've told people, he was the only roommate I had who was made a knight of the British Empire. <laughs> and he's, 
served in uh, the House of Commons for a number of years and represented the very area where Bassingbourne is. He represented that Cambridge area. And we visited him twice uh, in England. And uh, the second time we visited, visited him, uh, uh, he took us up to see some of the colleges at Cambridge. And uh, uh, it, it was a Sunday, and uh, the place was quite crowded, not very much parking. And uh, the campus cops in Cambridge wear a bowler hat. So he drove up to this place. That, uh, I couldn't figure out where he was going to leave his car. And this guy came out and said, uh, oh, Mr. Lane, uh, if you'd like to leave your car, just park it right over here. <laughs> <laughs> And we got out and walked around and saw some things. And this guy was the most charming fellow. He was a wonderful guy. And, uh, but I never was able to get him to come back over here, uh, which is something I regretted because we, we visited him twice in England. One time he took us through the House of Commons and, and uh, some of the things in London because he, he, they were in London at that time. The second time we visited him, he uh, was uh, had retired and he was living uh, uh, near Cambridge in a small town. Now you got a chance to go back and see the air base with... Uh... I went back to see the air base. And uh, I, I don't know if uh, that was an interesting story because... Um, my friend David Lane, of course, knew the uh, head, the uh, commanding officer of the infantry regiment that now occupied the air base. It was no longer an air base, it was an infantry uh, uh, camp. And <clears throat> it was a regiment that had uh, uh, fought uh, the uh, uh, rebellious colonists in the uh, <laughs> In the American in colonies? The, in the American <laughs> Revolution. Uh, and in more recent days, they had uh, uh, been in Burma during the Second War. And um, so anyway, uh, I said, I'd like, I said to my uh, David Lane, my ex-roommate, that uh, I would like to go see the base. And he said, well, that's, that could be done. Well, I'll call up. Uh, uh, my friend, the commanding officer, and tell him that you're coming. And uh, uh, when you get uh, when you get near the base, call him up and tell him uh, that you're about to arrive. And so, on. so uh, we we uh, did that. We I called him uh, from a local town, Royston, which is south of the of Bassingbourne. And uh, so when we got to the base, uh, they had an officer uh, designated to take us around. And in the, in, in the uh, communication, it, it, uh, I had been promoted from a staff sergeant to a colonel or something like that. <laughs> and I was given a, a, a royal treatment uh, as, a, as a retired colonel. And um, they, we went all around, and I couldn't recognize the place. It has changed so much. I was really surprised because I've got this mental image of exactly what it looked like, and I, I couldn't recognize it particularly. And uh, but they kept asking me about uh, 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 my fellow uh, commanding officers and so on, and of course I had to make up some kind of an excuse for not knowing much about it. And then they took us, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, to a room where the regimental silver was stored. And they had these big t uh, soup tureens and various huge silver things that had been, de had been donated by uh, previous uh, officers who had been with the regiment had and had retired, and it was customary to uh, that to, when they retired to 
just make a gift of some great huge thing to, uh, uh, to the regiment. And I knew exactly what was going to happen because this was in the, getting to be the late part of the morning and they were going to invite me, I'm sure, to have a, 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 a noon meal and get up and have some well-chosen words uh, as Colonel <laughs> that we retired. And I, I, my wife had been playing this perfectly too. She didn't let on anything at all. And, and uh, so, but I said that I was awfully sorry that I had a pressing engagement at the, wherever we were going to go and we couldn't tarry any longer. And we got in our, we got in our car and took off and I was heaved a great sigh of relief as I went out through the <laughs> through the guard station and onto the highway. Uh, the, um, had another post-war experience uh, too. Um, Nancy and I were uh, in the Cambridge area uh, with uh, my, uh, with David Lane and and we um, visited a, uh, a big estate that was near the air base and I remember it because I remember going past it when I was bicycling into Cambridge and uh, it was one of these uh, English uh, uh, manor houses uh, and then the long column of uh, uh, vista with trees planted on each side of the, of the vista and those trees had been elm trees that had all died and they were replanting them. But anyway, we, we, went, uh, we went to this uh, big old uh, uh, house and uh, it was, it was uh, uh, much like Glencheen, uh, a place of that nature uh, uh, where this uh, important family had this big establishment. It was now a sort of a, a museum and we, uh, we went through it and uh, uh, there was a lady there who was uh, one of the guides and, uh, and somehow or other it, uh, we got talking about the fact that the hospital that I had gone to was, had been situated on part of the grounds of this estate. And, uh, and, and this woman said, well, I remember that very well because when I was a young person, I one of my jobs working here in the bakery was to take bread over to the hospital every day. I'd take a big basket of bread and walk over to the hospital and deliver it to the, the mess hall there. <laughs> <laughs> so, sort of another little association. One thing I'd like to do before we close is, could you pull out the picture of yourself as a handsome young man and we'll maybe explain what all the things on the uniform are for people of future generations. Everything was downhill since then. <laughs> well, you were a good looking guy back well, in the uh, yeah. 40s. Uh, a lot of people uh, in the future may not know what all the, the various insignia and and badges and so forth. Well, there's only the several things showing here. Mm -hmm. One is the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Here, let's uh, and, maybe just maybe and, just do this. And of course, that uh, that the patch. Uh, <clears throat> I'll get it in both of the cameras there. So, so on the, your this would be your. When I was with the Eighth Air, this was before I was with the Eighth Air Corps. Mm -hmm. When the patch that you had when you. Eighth had an eight. Yeah, uh, with an eight on the, yeah, and this the is eight. this the U.S. Army Air Forces General. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Think they and call then the other thing I've got is the wings, and you get those when you graduate from the gunnery store, uh, gunnery school. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you I, still have your uniform? Yeah. Okay, so you have all of this at home. Yeah. The, for the yeah, future. I'm figuring, trying to figure out what the heck to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, I, needless to say, I can't wear any of that stuff anymore. I weighed 127 pounds when I was came out of the army, and mm -hmm. I weigh 160 now. 
and you were probably a lot of muscle running up those hills you were yeah. describing. Yeah, it was pretty And then the, on your, uh, let's see, this would be on your left uh, yeah, uh, there's lapel, a there's a little circular. Grass things, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what they mean. Uh, I, I'm, a little, I'm a little blank on exactly what they mean. I subsequently got some ribbons and so on. Mm -hmm. it was, it, uh, ribbon for the uh, European theater and, and there's a ribbon for uh, Purple Heart and there's an air mm -hmm. uh, combat uh, ribbon. Do you still have your um, discharge paper? Oh, oh sure. All that? Oh, sure. Good. Now, uh, in fact, I, I, I've got my original, I think, in a safe deposit box if you I'm not exactly sure uh, what use for it is unless you want to be buried in the uh, cemetery at Fort Snelling. I didn't choose to go that way myself. Mm -hmm. You have to produce uh, documentation. You actually I would imagine so, yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn these uh, cameras off now.